Instacart is one of the hottest tech IPOs in 2023. Despite slashing its valuation from almost $40 billion to less than $10 billion, its IPO makes the company's founder almost a billionaire, while making many Silicon Valley investors, including Y Combinator, a startup accelerator, a lot of money. But Instacart wasn't always this hot idea and a startup, nor was its founder a successful entrepreneur. Approva Mehta, the company's founder, is an Indian-born who went to school in Canada as an engineer and later moved to the US to work for Amazon. He had worked on 20 products and startups in the two-year period between quitting his job at the e-commerce giant in 2010 and launching Instacart in 2012 and sadly all failed from building an ad network for social gaming companies to spending a full year developing a social network specifically for lawyers. He tried many companies and none stuck. Instacart's $10 billion valuation and IPO success is the story of building the right product in a massive market at the right time. If you are curious about Instacart to care C-A-R-T cart, let's research it together. I am Hoda Mer, founder and CEO of Starcard, and on this channel I share detailed fundamental analysis and interesting investing related stories. This episode is a mix of interesting investing related stories and fundamental analysis. But before discussing either, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Instacart's corporate name isn't Instacart, it's Maplebur, doing business as Instacart. When the initial founding team incorporated the company in 2012, they registered it as Maplebur. Honestly, I spent an hour trying to figure out why Maplebur, but didn't find a good answer. So that's that. Now to the real story and the fundamental analysis. I started this episode by saying Instacart is the story of building the right product in a massive market at the right time. The online grocery market is rapidly growing with more than 25% expected annual growth rate until 2030. According to the company's IPO documentation, only 12% of grocery shopping is now happening online. And when you talk about a $1.1 trillion market, even a 1% increase in that rate means an $11 billion in revenue potential for Instacart. This is the advantage of building a product in a massive market such as groceries. It translates into significant growth potential for the company. By the way, if you want a list of other online grocery stocks, type grocery stocks in the search bar on stockcart.io and under the themes column, you'll find the list. If you are new to Stockcart, we manage a database of more than 500 themes and collections. We've got you covered if you are looking for online grocery stock list, generative AI stocks, EV stocks, or any other theme. Go to straka.io and look up the theme you are interested in in the search bar. You can also use the screener to make your search even more accurate. For example, what if you are looking for online grocery stocks with growing sales? Go to the screener tool, put online grocery in the keyword search bar and apply any additional filter you want. I just created this screener and I leave a link to it in the show notes in case you want to continue your research or copy the screener to your own free Stockcard account. Back to Instacart. The growth isn't limited to online grocery market. The company has also realized 
the power and profitability of the digital advertising business model. Roughly 30% of Instacart's revenue comes from advertising. This is when consumer packaged goods companies and brands pay Instacart to run special promotions and place their products in more prominent sections of the app and let them run promotions and deals directly to the customers. When I use Instacart to order my groceries, I'm always shocked by big brands' promotions and deals on the app. For example, there is always a big push by PepsiCo to purchase more of its snacks to get free delivery. When you dig into Instacart's IPO documentation, you'll realize Pepsi will invest $175 million in our IPO, indicating how important it is for big consumer packaged foods brand to directly influence the consumer's purchase decisions, and the online store is the best place to do so. The digital advertising and the chance to grab shares of consumer packaged goods at dollars expand Instacart's addressable market significantly. However, the idea of online shopping was new in 2012 when the company started its operations. Neither was the idea of online grocery shopping. Before Instacart, there were a myriad of online grocery companies. Webvan was the most known online grocery company that had raised more than $400 million in venture capital funding and operated for three years before it went under when the dot-com bubble burst in 2000 and 2001. How did Instacart succeed when many failed? It's all about timing. The online grocery concept could not have found a strong demand until e-commerce truly gained mass traction. In the US, the 2010s decade was when e-commerce started to really take off. Moreover, Instacart could only scale when it was able to harness the advantages of the gig economy. The gig economy refers to independent contractors hired for specific tasks. All Uber drivers and food delivery workers are considered gig workers. And that market also took off after the 2008 financial crisis, as many people look for supplemental income and other means to make any money. The gig economy has risen in the last decade with a 15% annual growth rate from 2010. Since 2015, three years after its founding, Instacart dabbled in the gig economy. It now heavily relies on its independent shoppers who get paid hourly to use the app to do grocery shopping on behalf of its customers. Without broad acceptance of the gig economy and the normalization of working as a gig worker, Instacart's operation couldn't have been as profitable as it is today because it doesn't need to own its own fleet or hire its shoppers, which makes its operations quite scalable. How does building the right product at the right time and in a massive market fare against our usual fundamental analysis framework? Instacart Take Care Cart has 8 million monthly active customers, 2.5 billion in annual revenue, 30% from advertising and the rest from fees, 40% year-over-year growth in 2022, 72% plus gross margin, 1.5% net income up from several years of negative net income, 251 million free cash flow, 10% free cash flow to revenue ratio. Almost $2 billion in cash versus $400 million in current liabilities. To say the least, Instacart has chosen the best moment in its operating history to go public and paint a good picture. However, I am concerned about the revenue growth, its business model's unit economics, and whether the expected roughly $10 billion IPO valuation is justified. 
at an almost 10 billion fully diluted valuation, the company is going public with an almost four and a half times price to sales ratio. The four and a half times price to sales ratio means it requires sustained 35% annual growth in revenue in the next five years to grow in that valuation. Historically, looking at its first half of 2023 versus 2022, the company achieved 31% growth. It also grew 39% in 2022 versus 2021. So the recent revenue growth is right about the 35% target it needs to achieve to justify its valuation. However, if you look at the number of orders on Instacart in the first half of the year versus last year, you see almost no growth. That's concerning. We need to see more evidence of such 30% plus revenue growth for a few more quarters to believe that revenue growth is sustainable. Even if the company has had its valuation from almost $40 billion in 2021 down to $10 billion in 2023, it isn't on their valued. But of course, companies don't reach their valuation just by growing sales. They become more profitable and generate more free cash flow to get higher multiples. There lies another concern about Instacart. After deducting the cost of sales, the biggest expense for Instacart is the cost of user acquisition. In 2022, the company spent nearly $650 million on customer acquisition. In the IPO documentation, Instacart talks about how before the COVID-19 pandemic, its unit economics wasn't mature. This means the cost of acquiring a user was quite higher than the revenue it would generate from each user. During the pandemic, the picture changed. They saw significant organic user growth leading to higher gross profit per user. There is the risk that people will gradually return to in-person shopping as we move away from the pandemic year after year. I see it in my own behavior. I was 100% an Instacart user during the pandemic and now less than once a month. Old habits die hard, as they say, and it took me a year after the pandemic to gradually move away from Instacart but it is happening. I expect Instacart needs to spend more and more on advertising and consumer incentives and discounts to acquire users and retain their existing one. Even now it is barely profitable. That's my biggest concern about buying the stock at the IPO. I want to see a few quarters of sustained user growth without a significant increase in user acquisition before jumping in. We have to talk about the advantages Instacart has as being the market leader. Other players such as Amazon Fresh, Uber Groceries, and other grocery delivery companies are far behind Instacart. And although they are gradually gaining market share away from Instacart, as per the IPO documentation, the company benefits from a much higher average order value than its competitor. In the online grocery segment, Instacart has the lead over others. Knowing all that, what do I plan to do with the IPO? I plan to let it go public and see how it can sustain its revenue growth in the coming quarters. There is simply too much of residual effect from the pandemic on consumer behavior that I would want to see a few more quarters of sustained growth and controlled user acquisition costs. If you have a different strategy, share it in the comments. And if you like an episode like this one with a mix of investing stories and fundamental analysis, like and subscribe so I know what you want to watch and listen to in the future. I'll see you next time.